Hello, Matrix, and welcome to Evolution, your last section of Matrix. How exciting! Woo! Alright, so now we're going to start with Evolution, but we don't just talk about Evolution as a whole, it's the idea of diversity, change, and continuity. So it is how humans have evolved okay, to become what you see um, in the mirror or what you're seeing in the tiny little screen at the bottom over there when you look at me. It's the idea that there are these two-legged structures, okay, so two legs and two arms, um, and how did it turn from four legs to two legs and two arms, and how did we go from like hunched over walking, pretty much using our arms as our legs, as well to standing upright, that's the important component of this whole thing, it's just how did humans actually come about, and why did they exist, um, how did natural selection kick in so hard that it had to sort of select for um, certain characteristics which allowed humans to develop as a whole. Um, this evolution as well is obviously, like we, I need to teach you the basics and we'll go over what those are, um, but as you can see from the diagram over there, <laughs> it's how humans really have sort of like gone backwards in there. So let's have a look at some of the stuff which we're going to be doing. We're first going to start with evolution by natural selection, so we're going to talk about the origin of an idea about origins. We're going to look at artificial selection, formation of a new species, mechanisms for reproductive isolation, evolution in present times. Now, the evolution in present times, we're not going to make human orientated for obvious reasons. Um, we don't want to scare away all the people who think that we do, um, you know, only, I don't know, like people who don't think we do evolution in school. Those people scare us. All right. Then we're going to look at human evolution. Uh, evidence from common ancestors, art of Africa hypothesis, which is really important, and the importance of the human uh, cradle of humankind, and then finally the alternatives to evolution. So from the beginning bit, the first bit I'm going to teach you is the basics of evolution. So all of those things that I'm going to teach you about, like evidence behind it, um, your genetics, as well as um, comparative embryology, biogeography, fossils, we're then going to look at how organisms can actually um, form so that when we do the formation of a new species, which is probably one of the most difficult components of this whole thing, it's the idea of when we spoke about biogeography as well, we're going to talk about sympatry and parapatry and allopatry. Okay, and this is just how an organism develops within a certain area based on. Um, what happened in the environment. And remember that when we did biogeography, I often brought up the idea that your environment is going to cause you to adapt and change. And if you cannot maintain and keep up with this idea of what is like, changing in the environment, the individual itself is not going to cope. Okay, so we're going to talk about survival of the fittest as well. And then we're going to talk about Darwinism and Lamarckism. So there's this guy called Jean Baptiste Lamarck, and he was this French nerd who thought, or thought that he knew what evolution was. And he came up with two laws. And one of the most intriguing one was the law of use and disuse. And um, we'll go through it a little bit later and we'll have a look at exactly how did these laws work and why were they so flawed. Um, now, if you walk into any academic uh, um, sort of conversation one day and you say, I follow Lamarckism, people will laugh at you. That is how bad Lamarckism truly is. Um, he had no idea what he was doing. Well, he had an idea, um, and since well, like since the time that it kind of was refuted by Darwin, um, you know, you, you always get those people who constantly say, okay, well, there must have been something behind it, even though it was just like, okay, here's a bicycle, and now here's a car, and then it goes, oh, but the bicycle was better, even though the car moves faster and better and more efficient. Um, then we're going to look at the mechanisms for reproductive isolation, um, and just like, how, if an individual like ends up in another part of the world, why does it shift and change? Okay, um, what has caused it to like? What are these selective pressures, and how the selective pressures actually cause this change? Um, the evolution in present times will be on microorganisms, just because they can actually evolve this quickly, and especially times with COVID at the moment. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. Probably YouTube's going to nail me for that. But anyway, uh, Miss Rona, um, you know, we saw with the alpha variant and beta variant. In Delta variant and now the Lambda variant, um, how rapidly it's actually changing and evolving based on its environment. And that could be because of a whole bunch of things, probably specifically because people potentially are getting the vaccine. You know, there's no way of actually isolating the, uh, the, um, the actual virus quick enough and causing a lot of human bodies to, to defeat it quick enough so that we can put it to one side and isolate it 
and then actually get rid of it. So evolution in present times. The human stuff is chunky. There is a lot to go through. Uh, the evidence of common ancestors, we're going to go through a whole bunch of things called the Australopithecus, um, Ardipithecus, we're going to talk about Homo erectus, Homo naledi, we're going to talk about where they came from, why they're here, why they're important, why South Africa is famous for a lot of this stuff, how South Africa currently still has the world's um, oldest fossil or the hominid fossil, but there's been um, people from China who said that they found the oldest fossil, were people from, I think it was somewhere in Europe, they said that they found the oldest fossil. But still to this day, um, what maybe you want to go read up about it is a lady, well, a lady, um, she was called Mrs. Place. Okay? And we'll talk about why she was called Mrs. Place a little bit later. But it was the idea that she is possibly one of our oldest evolutionary um, hominids. And this was discovered by someone by the name of Lee Burger. Um, I once had a, well, not a conversation, like at my graduation, he spoke. Uh, he's an American, and his son was actually part of the discovery team to come and find a lovely little Miss Place. It was, it was quite scandalous, actually. Um, but Homer and Lady was found by his son, and there was a whole bunch of drama around it, as you can imagine. And the importance of the cradle of humankind. This is the place that was actually on the chimney planner that I would have loved to have taken you to. COVID just keeps on getting worse and worse, so we'll, we'll figure it out as we go along. Um, and then remember I said to you that the oldest fossil was found in Africa. Um, not South Africa as well, but Africa. And we find this from the, uh, the out of Africa hypothesis, where it was in the regions of sort of like Ethiopian places like that. They um, found some of the oldest uh, fossils, and they thought that all humans originated from there and then shifted up and out all over the world. And we'll talk about how that's actually been functioning. There's also, there's a whole bunch of theories around it though, and there is an alternative to the Art of Africa hypothesis. People just don't like it because they don't understand it. We'll get you through that. And then finally, because you know, you are modern humans and you need to be able to make your own opinion, we will talk about the alternatives to evolution. You need to be fully aware when someone walks up to you and says, this is evolution, you can say, mm, actually yes or actually no. Uh, there is a lovely podcast that you can go and watch if you want to look at the alternatives to evolution. So let's say you don't believe in evolution whatsoever. Um, you can go and read these things. I can't remember what the name is now, but it's like something against evolution. Um, you, know, you can go have a look for that. All right. Sorry for a little bit of delay there. My um, gas bottle just decided to stop and it was making noise. So I had to quickly put it off. Right. So what is evolution? It's a very gradual process and you need to remember that speed is not of importance when it comes to evolution. Evolution is mainly due to, or like, or more, it's more important to select for the most fit individuals as opposed to, um, you know, getting through it as quick as possible because an individual exhibits something called plasticity, okay, and plasticity is with, it's a range as to how far an individual can be pushed until it dies or it survives better okay so you can be very plastic as a species which means that there is there isn't a need for a lot of evolution because you as an individual are actually coping and surviving quite well for the species um, we can look at it at a whole bunch of different levels we can look at the individual level we can look at it at the species level um, we are going to look majority at the species level, so I need to remember to say species more often. But when I say it's a gradual process, it's literally, it literally can take millions of years. It can take tens of thousands of years. Uh, for instance, us as hominids, as human, homo sapiens um, ourselves, we only appear on the evolutionary time scale about approximately 10, 12,000 years ago. Some people push it as far as like 15,000 years ago. Um, our fossils, our fossil range kind of says between into into twelve thousand years ago. That that's when Homo sapiens only arrived. So, you know, who would think that you know in 10, 000, 10 to twelve thousand years we could have been at this point? Not many people, but um, you know, it's relatively fast. I mean, we're talking thousands of years, and some take millennia of years. Okay, so this is where organisms change, and remember they change and adapt due to or because of their environment. And for a better and more complex form, which sounds absolutely terrible. Why would evolution pick for a more complex individual as opposed to a simpler individual that could survive in its environment? The complexity of this is what we view as complex and what you know, 
complexity in terms of you know the complex because of the dna and the muscles and the tissues and you know the nervous system and all those different things like is that more complex or are they just bigger and bigger versions of like um, insect which is us bigger and better versions of a fish which is us all right also i need to point out at this um like this stage now that remember if you encounter anyone who says something silly like oh we originated from monkeys punch them in the face a because we came from apes b we share a common ancestor with those individuals and that's what shows that right and wrong at the bottom over there so wrong is that the cactus turns into the beetle which turns into the, the fish and which turns into the human okay and then the humans at the top of the log please remember Humans didn't, or Homo sapiens didn't arrive one day by Homo erectus randomly start flashing and all of a sudden going, oh, I've learned a language and my brain's bigger. And look at me walk upright and my arms are shorter now than my legs. And, you know, it wasn't like that. It was over a very slow process where you know, a particular individual from the species was better adapted than the rest of the Homo erectus. And that eventually pushed the species um, to change and like, Every single time that individual learned to survive better in its environment, it reproduced. And as it reproduced, thusly, that individual survived better. And then those genes kept on being passed down the generations until they were so far away from the original Homo erectus that they were then called Homo sapiens. So this also, like you can imagine, becomes interesting now because it has to be this intermediate part between what was between Homo erectus and Homo sapien. You know, do we have to call it something different? Um, you know, sometimes we find something called an intermediate tree species. So, for instance, if we were looking at Homo naledi and then we looked at Homo sapien, um, the, all the species in between could be called intermediate tree species. But also we find these individuals that are half Homo naledi, sorry, half Homo erectus and half Homo sapien. Okay? So they exhibit um, characteristics from both species, but over time one is more selected for than the other. And what is correct in this is that there's a branch of or a tree, a family tree of all these different species. And these species stem from an original common ancestor, which we still to this day think is a protist. OK, so we think that there was a single cell organism that acted like an uh, well, there was animal like and it was able to grab more cells. The cells were able to um, specialize through the process of differentiation. They then gave each other jobs and these jobs sort of developed and the individual developed as a whole throughout that as well. So um, there is a whole bit on, you know, what is the difference in an effect and opinion and a scientific theory, but I'm gonna kind of fast track you through this a little bit. So what is a like what is a theory versus a law? I feel like that's maybe more important to be aware of than opposed to okay, what's a fact and what's a theory. So a theory is based on information that's available at the time and it may change as new information is discovered, which means that a theory is not a fact, right? A lot of theories, I mean gravity is a theory, the gravitational theory, uh, law, of, uh, the theory of law, <laughs> gravitational theory of um this is gravitational theory it's not working right now in my head sorry about that um but it's a, it's a theory it's not a law we don't talk about the gravitational law we talk about the gravitational theory all right so i mean if, if gravity was not real i mean we'd be floating all around the earth uh, because there'd be nothing to pull us to the center of so a lot of these theories are based on very hard evidence um Evolution, however, is very difficult to base on evolution on evidence because humans want to see evolution happening right here, right now. And then you say to them, okay, fine, well, here's evolution and natural survival of the fittest um, for uh, bacteria and viruses and stuff. And then all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, you know, but that's not a human. And you're like, okay, cool. Well, such a complex individual, like a species such as Homo sapiens, you know, it's not like they're going to snap their finger and all of a sudden they're going to become a new species. So, to a large extent, there is quite a lot of modern day evolution that is happening with humans. So, for instance, we're finding that um, some of you are being born without this tendon over here. We're finding that some of you can no longer move your ears. Some can, some can't. We're, we only have um, three own rods to be able to see color with some kids are now being born with four rods which means that they can see in better colors and this is kind of interesting and kind of uh, because we're constantly focusing on social media we're focusing on new colors when flashing light comes past us we quickly go, turn to have a look at it you know we're not focused on being 
individuals that are scared of predators, we're now focusing on surviving better within our environment and being the best individual that we can possibly be. So just in terms of a theory, remember that it's based on information and evidence, and it may change depending on as and when we change as well. So the theory of evolution, these are the four main pillars of the evidence of evolution. So this is pro-evolution. So as we go along, a lot of this will be pro-evolution, and some of it I'll like turn around and say, no, this isn't correct, so that you guys are aware of it. Um, it's based on evidence from the fossil record, comparative anatomy, biogeography, and genetics. So the fossil record, you all are fully aware that there are these individuals that died many years ago. Um, when they died, they, their bodies, most, uh, sometimes, um, and not very often actually, um, sort of mineralized or became, like the sediments started moving into their bones. And as that happened, it actually made them stronger, which turned them into rocks. A large extent um that is one version of it the other versions for instance you've all seen and we'll see a picture of it a little bit later where there was an insect that was um, encapsulated in amber and that fossilized the particular individual some fossils are not necessarily a body but the trace of the body so you've all seen like if you've ever watched a um man what is that Jurassic Park or something when the huge dinosaur like leaves that big footprint in the ground and that big footprint can also be Fossilized, okay, so we can have trace fossils uh, There's a whole different like, whole bunch of them and I'll show you some pictures of them By geography we did this last year. We did it in extensive um, Quite a bit of like detail. It's the idea that the earth is made out of these continents, which is true by the way It's not just kind of based on um, and these con continents are actually able to move, and as they move and shift around, individuals that are on that piece of land actually move around with them. And because they move to different areas um, on the world, uh, in the world, they are going to adapt to their environment. And as they adapt and change, they will change as an individual themselves. And then we're going to look at genetics. Um, we're going to dig into something called mitochondrial DNA. We're going to look at you know, if I have the gene to uh, let me think of an example quickly. We have, I have a gene to create melanin, and dogs have the gene to create melanin. Um, or I have genes to create teeth, and so do dogs, and so do cats, and so do cows. Sure, the genes for teeth are slightly different, and they all grow in different ways, but they're still all producing teeth. Okay, So there had to have been some sort of ancestral genetic code which traveled a long time and actually allowed for all of this to happen. Finally, we're going to look at comparative anatomy. We did this last year where we'll actually have a look at a baby um, cow, salamander, amphibian, there's a fish we're going to look at. I think it's a sheep and a human. And you'll notice that they all look almost identical, which means that we had to have had some sort of common ancestor many moons ago or many, many millennia ago, which gave rise to all of us as individuals. Okay, so organisms look different from each other. Because of environmental changes, we're okay with this, hopefully, because we remember this from biogeography. Um, as the environment, like if I have a lot of hair all over my body from head to tail, and you put me in the middle of the Sahara Desert, I'm probably not going to cope very well. Um, if I am a very, if I have very, very dark fur, um, and again, you put me in the, um, uh, man, the desert, you'll probably find that I'll, over, I'll cook it as well. If you give me dark fur and you put me in the Antarctic, I'll probably die as well because the predators will be able to see me. So based on my environment, the perfect genes or the selected for genes will be selected for. And that is what we call a selection pressure. OK, so there's a pressure to develop one or other kind of gene. And this gene should then be selected for within the environment to allow for the species to survive better. Evidence for evolution, we're going to look at the fossil record, modification by descent. We also did that last year, genetics and comparative embryology. In this lesson, I'm only going to go up to fossil record, and then we'll do modification by descent, job biogeography, and genetics embryology in the next lesson. So these are going to be quite jam-packed, I must admit. All right, this is a pretty picture of a dinosaur, just so you know where we are going. Okay, so the fossil record, science of discovering and studying the fossil record is called paleontology. You need to know this word, okay? Um, please don't get paleontology confused with archaeology. Archae meaning ancient, okay? So they're, they're studying of the ancient things. We're studying the fossil records. So the paleontologists are really just studying the, it kind of means like time, all right? And they're going to be studying uh, the fossil records.
record what appeared when and why. The paleontologists want to know the structure and adaptation of the organism, how did the organism interact with each other, and the physical environment at the time. With the knowledge of those three things, they can be able to figure out what the environment was actually. So if you find an individual that has lost all of its hair, you must kind of guess that they've lost their hair for a particular reason. If you see a um, organism with maybe a, another skeleton inside of it, it could a, mean that they um, were pregnant. But if you can see that the skeleton's different, you can then pick up on what they were eating. All right. So this idea of paleoanthropology becomes a thing as well. And paleoanthropology in hominids, which is like all of your human-like or ape-like individuals, as well as um, uh, no, the hominins are slightly different. Okay. So we're going to like in terms of hominids. You can also see how these individuals survived. You can also see based on their skeleton. So if they had a very thick and robust skeleton, it might mean that they had access to lots of calcium. It might mean that they were very strong predators. You could look at their teeth and recognize, oh, they're all flat, which means that they were herbivore, or they were all like sharp, which meant that they might have been carnivores. Or if they had a mixture, they would have been an omnivore at that time, which was very odd. You were generally mostly only carnivore or before there was no real in between that we really know of, but I'm pretty sure there are. Okay. Fossils are the traces of dead organisms. There is a definition for you, please write that down. There may be a whole organism, fragment, or traces. Example footprints or poop. droppings are also known as a um, fossil because, by definition, it's traces of dead organisms. So if you find there is poop over there and you can identify the DNA that's inside of the feces, you can then say with, without even any struggles whatsoever that, hey, this organism did live in this particular environment. Um, and then, you know, hopefully you do get a stool sample as well or a um, feces sample because that should be able to tell you what the individual as well was eating. Note, normally organisms and, oh, sorry, die and vanish without a trace. However, under certain circumstances, an organism's body may be preserved as a fossil. So there's actually a very slim chance. I think it's like a, I don't know, it's in the single figures, like what the chance of fossilization actually is within an individual. Okay, so let's look at the types of fossils. I do not expect you to know these off by heart. So we have petrification, permineralization, mold, past, compression, Qualification and amber. Uh, I can't remember. There's one more. I'm going to quickly talk. So your past is when something has actually put an imprint into um, a substance that can actually fossilize. We have qualification, petrification, and permineralization, which are all slightly similar. It just depends what actually infuses into the bones and sets them. So it's these the idea of minerals like fusing into porous parts of the bone because remember your bone's not solid it has those little holes and those minerals can actually get into those holes and actually set the thing as a whole um, then we have compression where things are pushed and they actually the, ca the carbon itself actually binds and that forms everything together we have amber which is the um, sap that leaks out from a tree and as the sap leaks out is very sticky when insects land on it and sometimes they're attracted to it um, the insect will be stuck into that particular substance and then more amber will, or more sap will fall over it and eventually harden, creating an amber fossil. And finally, we have a trace, which is very similar to your cross and your molds. It's again, like sometimes leaves fall into like a mud or sediment and like you can, the imprint itself is left behind while the um, soft tissue of the leaf disappears. The fossilization may occur in different ways. An entire animal may be preserved, example, mammoth or insect trapped in amber. Remember that there are mammoths that are um, fossilized in ice. Okay, so some of them are frozen. That's also seen as a type of um, uh, fossilization, more like a cryopreservation, if anything. Fossils that might have been caught up in sediments, uh, sorry, it's not, it's not supposed to be sediment tat. The sediment ion process and may had their bones replaced by another chemical. We'll, we're not going to get into the details of this, but we'll talk about fossilization as a whole. So this is what an amber fossil looks like. Uh, this is a frozen woolly mammoth, but obviously a baby version of it. That is permineralization of a bone. You can actually see these crystals starting to like piss out of the bone itself. 
There is a lo lovely little trilopod, and these were insects that were found in the ocean. Some of these went oh, like as big as about 1.5 meters long, and they swam around in the ocean. They were insects, okay? So imagine a very aggressive, like, prawn. <laughs> Um, and there we can see a lovely trace fossil of a leaf. Um, there is even the paleobotanists, which occur in real life. Um, I knew a woman, um, really interesting people, but very weird at the same time, um, where they were looking for these imprints and they were able to figure out whether there were seeds or not and when the seeds actually arrived based on, you know, whether you could see the veins were parallel or the veins were branched, which indicated whether it was a monocot or a dicot. There was a whole bunch of stuff that was going on as well. Okay, so let's look at the process of uh, fossilization. We have living fish A. Living fish A dies. Then it is enclosed in sediment. Now, let's quickly deal with what the idea of sediment is. You can imagine that there's an extremely fine sand. That sand, when you walk into a river or a dam, as you put your feet in, your feet kind of sink into the sludge, and it's difficult to get your hands out. And it's also the dirt that gets in all the nooks and crannies like under your fingers so imagine a very 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 fine dust extraordinarily fine dust and this dust can actually come from the process like from the river as it goes down remember those rocks are grind together and as they grind it together they become smaller and smaller and smaller and this eventually leads to sediment being created we spoke about it last year as well when we spoke about sedimentation in rivers and dams that actually cause flooding then the hard parts become fossilized, so this means that the sediment actually got into the bones. Then we have living fish B, it also dies and it's also enclosed in sediment. Now, what they're trying to get to here is that you can see that there are different layers. Now, if you can like, recognize how long it takes for sedimentation to occur, you can figure out at which point did these fish die and how old they are according to the fossil record. And their hard parts also fossilized. All right. The sediment eventually becomes rock, and fish B becomes a fossil much later than fish A, which means that fish A was an older fossil than fish B. The deeper the rock layer, the older the fossil. This is true most of the time. <laughs> because you can imagine that if um, there was some sort of earthquake or Two continents collided into each other and all their ground kind of pushed against itself and forced all their, their ground to go upwards. All the ancient ground that you thought was really old is now actually on top. So it's up to the scientists to take soil samples all the way down to try and figure out and then compare to the soil on top of the ground um, and then they can tell how old the ground is around those particular fossils. Same thing over here, it's just a Again, so you can see it, we have living fish, sediment from the river, fish skeleton, a skeleton partly buried by sediment. And then over time, more and more fish die as that die, the um, sediment becomes hard rock and infuses into the bones. And as it infuses, you can see these different layers forming. And as those layers form, so we can tell the different um, ages of the soil. And please remember that you, know, you think to yourself, okay, rock is rock is rock. But remember that the environment that affects the soil also changes. So you'll be able to pick high amounts of certain um, chemicals. Maybe there's high amounts of carbon dioxide. Maybe there's high amounts of sulfur. Maybe there's high amounts of magnesium based on all the crazy things that have ha actually happened over time throughout those periods. And we can pick that up by looking at the depth of the soil. All the sediment becomes rock the fish skeleton becomes fossilized okay this is based on compression now this is an example of where things kind of go wrong so land raised above the water level we have recent rock on top and we have all the rock below that and then sometimes there is an earthquake and that entire thing shifts okay so like this is kind of telling you two things that you would need to check the date of the skeleton by the soil based on a soil profile all the way down and second of all you might find um, the fossil at the top over there and think to yourself, hey, I found this fish. And then you go digging a little bit lower and you find another skeleton and you think to yourself, oh my gosh, the fish lived for, from this period of time all the way to the other period of time when in actual fact it was the same fossil just split across two different things. Okay? Um, and you might be confused to think as well, like if you took a soil profile from the wrong spot, you might think that this sort of darker brown color underneath there 
um, actually was the same as the one on the right, which is the lighter peachy color. So it really like fossil like paleontology is not a very exact science. Um, it's extremely difficult. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do at all. And scientists do practice you know, very rigorous science. And that's why often when a fossil is found, it has to be sent and then it is tested for months on end. Um, and then they compare it to different fossils in different countries and they make sure that, you know, this particular species could have existed in that period of time. It's, it's really tough. Okay, so this is the earth movement which fractures the rock. The fossilized skeleton becomes exposed and that makes it easier to find. Okay. I recommend you pause this video and you draw this. This is the quick and easy method of actually getting through um, evolution. So we have death and sedimentation occurs. We have um, where the organism is compacted by layers on top of it. Eventually we have continental drift and then we have this erosion which occurs which could cause the shifting and exposure of different fossils. How fossils form in a sedimentary rock, however, here we can see a beautiful example of all those different layers, and in each different layer is a different era of time, okay? Remember that land does not, like, the thickness of the land does not occur very quickly, so to a large extent you'll find that there are entire, um, like, meters upon meters of ground and then other times there's very thin layers of ground and each one of those is a completely different era and what you can find in there will tell you about the past and this is what makes it important so the sequence of fossils within every uh, every set of undisturbed sedimentary rocks shows a change from simpler to more complex organism um, in the younger um, layers sedimentary rocks provide a fossil record for the history on earth we kind of know this and scientists rely on this and a lot of our family trees actually like um, species trees come from that the fossil record is incomplete and likely remain for um, remain so for two reasons fossilization is a very rare event and soft-bodied organisms are unlikely to be fossilized so a crab is a great example of something that will fossilize like that super quick everything's hunky-dory however you can imagine something like a jellyfish or um, maybe something like a flatworm or platyhelminthi. Those might take a lot, lot, lot longer, or it might just never ever happen. It's so rare. Okay. So from the fossil record, these are all approximates, by the way. The Earth is approximately 4.5 billion years old. The first life forms appeared 3.8 billion years ago. How do we know this? We found remnants of um, cell membrane as well as some type of DNA in rocks people have actually done a lot of work on. Today's life forms are more complex than those of long ago. So many life forms have gone extinct. Alrighty, that's your introduction to evolution. I, I know this video is a little bit long. I'm checking out about 33 minutes, um, but it means a lot of me talking and very little of you writing. So I hope you guys are feeling okay and um, miss you guys and hopefully we'll potentially see you on Monday. Enjoy your day. Bye.